Reenactments. They have become one of the most recognizable elements of a documentary. It's one of the features that's unique to the genre, because how else do you depict something that's happened without archival footage? Sure, you can have people talk about it in a series of talking heads and leave it up to the viewers to imagine it, but it will never be as engaging as watching it all play out on the screen through reenactments. But documentaries are often thought of as something that aims to capture the truth, and reenactments blur the line between truth and fiction. This prompts the question about the role of truth in reenactments. To unpack that question, we first need to understand the history of documentaries and its relationship with reenactments. A documentary is a merge of non-fiction and cinema, a merge of reality and fabricated storytelling. It's a dichotomy that started with the first film to ever be classified as a documentary, Nanook of the North. Robert Flaherty's famous Nanook of the North captured the life of an Inuit family as they survived in the harsh northern climate, but the entire film was a reenactment of what Flaherty managed to capture on film five years prior. What we saw was Flaherty's recreation of his memory, which was heavily flourished with the romanticized interpretation of the Inuit people. The reenactments represented the Inuit people as noble savages when they were already more technologically advanced and capable at the time, which brought about the ethical issues of representing the truth through reenactments. Many filmmakers of the documentary genre tried to combat this issue by removing the need for reenactments. I'm just a lonely boy. This gave birth to the direct cinema style, which aimed to capture events in real time. The issue is that it could still be argued that the presence of the camera itself tampers with reality, which doesn't solve the dichotomy. But another important aspect to direct cinema was that it was not always engaging either. This is where reenactments made a reappearance in a documentary genre and boomed after its incorporation with interviews in The Thin Blue Line. Instead of solving the dichotomy, The Thin Blue Line chose to double down on its fictional aspect and turned it into a core part of the film. The film used reenactments to visually portray each subject's account of the cop killing case, which made the film feel like a whodunit story as it started to leverage the fictional storytelling methods in a non fiction film. But the film managed to balance these elements in an engaging way, so much so that it became a new standard for documentaries. But as documentaries have matured, so has reenactments. As Bill Nichols puts it, reenactments occupy a strange status, in which it is crucial that they be recognized as a representation of a prior event, while also signaling that they are not a representation of contemporaneous events. It also transports the audience into the phantasmatic domain, where they can live out what supposedly happened in real life on the screen. This means reenactments create immersion and engagement for its audience, and while most audiences know that it's not the truth, the film does not always remind them of that. So, if reenactments aren't going away anytime soon, perhaps there's a way to address the issue of presenting truth within the reenactments themselves. Garnet C. Bouchard attempted to address this in this article. He presented two ways that filmmakers can hold themselves responsible in presenting truth. These methods have to do with the visual mode of address, or in other words, how the film presents itself to the audience. Bouchard believes that the best way for a documentary to be truthful is by acknowledging the fact that it is a construction of the filmmaker. He suggests the following two approaches. First is by doubling the visual mode of address. This is done when a filmmaker directly addresses the relation of power between themselves and the participants involved. And secondly is by redoubling the visual mode of address. This is done when the filmmaker exposes the process of filmmaking itself and weaves it into the narrative. These techniques essentially break the illusion that fictional elements like reenactments try to maintain. This way, audiences are not being unknowingly manipulated by the filmmaker or the assumption that the camera does not lie. It's in this very clash that may be the key to dismantling the dichotomy of truth and reenactments. We see each of these techniques at play in Stories We Tell and the Act of Killing. Sarah Poli's Stories We Tell is a documentary that examines the filmmaker's personal and family life. Sarah documents her mother's complicated life that led to her own birth, and throughout the film we grapple onto the question of what stories we tell each other can do to the truth. To approach this, Sarah doubles the visual mode of address throughout the film by interviewing people in relation to her and making it clear who they are to her. The film begins with her bringing her dad into the recording studio, and always addressing him as dad instead of another participant. Sarah also makes the audience aware of this recording process that is happening, and makes it clear that he is about to voice over the film with a letter that he wrote for her. All this? Yeah. That's the whole of the thing that I wrote. 
It's a fair punishment, that. This moment is intercut with her siblings settling down into the interview locations while the recording equipment and warm-up conversations are kept in the film. Once the interviews begin, the relation of power between Sarah as a filmmaker and daughter to the interviewee is made clear here. So dad, can you tell the whole story, the marriage to mom and everything that happened since? <laughs> and her relationship as someone in the family is made clear here. I'm going to ask you now to tell the whole story as though I don't know the story from the very beginning to the very end. The doubling also goes further throughout the film with fake home video footages being mixed in with real ones shot on Super 8 film. The grainy quality of the Super 8 film acts as a visual separator between the past and the present and allows the audience to enter the phantasmatic domain that Bill Nichols described earlier. The distinction between the real and fake footages aren't made clear throughout the film either. It is only towards the end of the film that the fabrication of the reenactments are shown to us, while a voiceover is being played. The voiceover describes the inaccuracy and misconceptions of human memories when reconstructing the past to tell our stories. These two elements come together to address how truth is being approached here in this documentary. It shows that while everything we've seen and heard may be true, it should still be taken with a grain of salt, as no reconstruction is perfect. These reenactments are directed by Sarah Poli and comes from her perspective and her perspective alone. This documentary can also be considered as a documentoir, as it explores Sarah Poli's past as written and directed by her using the interviews that she has obtained from her fathers, sibling, and other major players. K.J. Waits goes even as far enough to compare these reenactments to literary devices used in written memoirs, since they both construct an identity and are the basis for memory-driven storytelling. Waits also claims how Polly uses her narrative film experience to create a film about self-exploration. This self-exploration is mediated by the doubling of the visual mode of address, which demonstrate how Sarah Polly's status as a director affects the truth that we see within the film reenactments. But then what happens if we redouble the visual mode of address? Joshua Oppenheimer's The Act of Killing documents a group of former Death Squad members from the Indonesian mass killings of 1965 to 1966. The former members tell the stories of their glory days with pride while reenacting it for the documentary. The film is a hybrid between the traditional interview documentary style and the direct cinema style as it lets its subjects do whatever they need to create their reenactments and occasionally has the subjects sitting down and talking to the camera. The film redoubles the visual mode of address by letting the creation of the reenactments be the core narrative of the film. With these reenactments, the audience witness the subject's confrontation with the consequences of their own actions. As an ode to the gangster films that the Death Squad members loved growing up, they decided to make their reenactment films as a gangster B-movie. The film primarily follows Anwar, who undergoes the biggest change throughout the film. At the beginning of the film, he freely boasts about the killings that he did and even showed some of the techniques for the camera. But as the film goes on, Anwar's past started to come back and haunt him. Anwar reaches a breaking point when he is on the set playing as one of the victims being killed by his own wire technique. He started genuinely fearing for his life and brought a halt to the production. And over its two hour runtime, the film is unapologetically intimate with Anwar, and even makes the audience start empathizing with him when he breaks down at the end of the film. As Mike Minghetti details in his article, the reenactment does two related functions throughout the film. The first function is to show how the stylized reenactment allowed most of the wrongdoers to transfer their guilt onto the reenactments themselves, and the second function is to show how the process triggers Anwar's self-realization as he becomes haunted by nightmares and feared karmatic retribution as the shoot went on. Both of these functions would contribute to the audience's understanding of the situation as well as the people who would commit them. And by redoubling the visual mode of address, the documentary is able to show a different type of truth. It's not a type of truth that fills in the missing gap of a story, but it's the type of truth that informs the psychology and personality of the people making the reenactments, which give the audience a deeper understanding of the subject of the film and the truth beyond the reenactments. While doubling and redoubling the mode of visual address begin to unravel the complexity of showing truth on a movie screen, it is far from a commonplace practice. 
At the end of the day, an important thing to remember about documentaries is that it's about money. Documentaries, like fiction films, are a commercial product, and it's meant to provide entertainment while exploring serious real-life topics. There's a reason we don't see self-reflexive documentaries that deal with the ethics of truth, like stories we tell and the act of killing often, and that's because they aren't often commercially successful. Most documentaries nowadays prioritize on the entertainment value and barely acknowledge the role of reenactments and how it affects the truth. Something like the 2021 documentary Operation Varsity Blues does almost very little to address the ethics of truth in reenactments. The most it does is give a disclaimer that the dialogue have been modified or combined for time and clarity. But the main appeal of the film is still that the recreations are based on the real call transcripts released by the US government. The film also uses a recognizable actor to play as an on-screen version of the documentary's subject. Matthew Modine, who's famous for being in Full Metal Jacket, acts out every phone call, which is almost verbatim to the transcripts, but he also does the B-roll footages when someone describes his behavior. This reenactment blurs a line of representation as the subject is based on hard evidence such as call transcripts, but also word of mouth. Everything in the documentary is accepted as truth, and without the double or redoubling of the visual mode of address, this documentary, like most others today, never attempt to reflect on how their reenactments can manipulate the truth. Doubling and redoubling the mode of visual address in documentary reenactments create a self-reflexive presentation that begins to address the ethical issues of using reenactments to represent truth. Stories we tell double the visual mode of address to show the issues of finding truth from reenactments due to the director's artistic choices and human flaws. The act of killing redoubles the visual mode of address to reveal a second layer of truth that shows the psychology of its subjects and allows its audience to learn more about them so they can get to the truth. But even if it's not commonplace, infusing the visual modes of address with reenactments question the relationship of documentary to truth, and how we can never re-experience a time that has already passed. Joanna puts it best in Stories We Tell. I guess that, to me, is another misconception that there is a state of affairs, or things that actually happened, and we have to kind of reconstruct exactly what happened in the past. And I don't think there ever was a what actually happened. I think there were lots of perspectives from the very beginning. You don't ever get to an answer. You don't ever get to, okay, now we figured it out. We know exactly what happened. We know exactly what kind of person she was. I think those things are just illusory.